Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're in Jerusalem, and we're joined again by Shir Hever. He's an economist at the Alternative Information Center in Jerusalem, and is the author of the upcoming book, The Political Economy of Israeli Occupation. Thanks for joining us, Shir. So who profits from the occupation? Well, the first question should be whether the occupation is profitable at all. And that uh, argument that, that Israel is actually an imperialist, colonialist state uh, uh, which only occupies the, terri the Palestinian territories for, for monetary profit has been made. It has mostly been made by, by Marxists. Uh, and, uh, and the argument is very valid if you look at the period between 1967 and the early 80s. There's a period from the 48 to 67, yeah. which Palestinians also consider occupation. It's, so it's, it's more than occupation. It's uh, ethnic cleansing, it's um, the, the deportation of uh, about 700,000 people from their homes, including uh, massacres and, and, and the destruction of villages. So it's not just occupation in the sense of the occupation of the Palestinian territories of 67, where it was a military rule imposed on a population. This was really cleansing an area from the population, from its native population. So I'm, I'm not sure if the word occupation is strong enough. So when you talk about occupation, you mean after 1967, where the, because uh, obviously uh, the Palestinians, uh, the issue of occupation goes into 1948. Of, uh, of course, but uh, uh, what, what we see in 48 is a kind of uh, takeover of, of land in a much more complete way. Uh, in order to create a Jewish state that not only rich Jewish people controlling a workforce of Palestinians, it's not the, a similar uh, situation to, to South Africa, for example, where a, a small white minority controlled a, a, a large black workforce. This is an idea to have Jews as the workforce as well. And that's why there was such a, a large migration from Arab countries of Jews who would become the new workforce for, in this state. So Palestinians had no room at all in that. But in 67, the, uh, they felt that the Israeli uh, government felt they cannot repeat the same ethnic cleansing, that they're not in a, in a political position that allows them to simply um, uh, deport all the Palestinians from the West Bank in Gaza. And they had a very uh, famous uh, quote, which was initially coined by Golda Meir. She said, we want the dowry, but not the bride. We want the land, we want the resources, we want the water, but we don't want the people living there. But we're stuck with them. Now, we talked to uh, a, an Israeli historian who said that uh, in the 1967 war, there was a perceived threat that Egypt was about to attack. And it's still, he said, a debate whether Egypt really was planning to attack or not. But one way or the other, the issue was settled within a matter of hours when Israel took out the Egyptian Air Force. And then the question is whether or not to go further and he kind of said it was sort of an irrational moment to go and take East Jerusalem and to go take the West Bank. That strategically, the army had been arguing it actually wasn't a good thing to do. Um, I don't agree with this uh, distinction of the Zionist movement into the rational and irrational. There is a kind of image that the Zionist movement is divided into the pragmatic or rational, also known as the Zionist left which is basically uh, those Zionists who believe that uh, Israel should have sustainable borders with a Jewish majority. And therefore, they're against Israel's continued occupation of the 67 uh, territories, arguing that that would undermine Israel's democracy. And on the other side, there is the, this perception of the irrational Zionism or, or messianic Zionism, of those who, who uh, simply believe in, in some kind of divine providence which will allow it, uh, Jews to continue to be a majority or will continue to be in control regardless of how far you push the borders, how much territory you keep controlling. And they see Zionism as an ongoing movement to keep on getting more and more, more, and more of the promised land. And the promised land goes on very far. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree to this distinction. I think this distinction serves an internal purpose within Israel and it mostly serves to appease international criticism because whenever there is some kind of uh, a pressure and maybe some governments in Europe are saying to Israel, how, how do you expect us to accept when you're violating international law like this? And then the Israeli government would say, if you put too much pressure on us, you're helping the messianic crazy Zionists and you should cooperate with us and work with us so that the pragmatic Zionists could stay in power and that's the only way to end the occupation. So 
as long as you keep thinking that the only way to end occupation is to engage the moderates within Israel, you only feed the, the status quo and the, the continued occupation. Well, part of the argument given was that the occupation of the West Bank and East Jerusalem is not particularly good for Israel. And, and I asked you earlier, who profits from the occupation? So why occupy the West Bank? I think that this level of pragmatism and irrationality exists in every part of the Zionist movement. And the same people who are supposedly uh, rational and, and trying to make choices, East Jerusalem, yes, but Gaza, no, are also the same people who with great enthusiasm uh, uh, prayed at the Wailing Wall and, and said this, this would be a, a good time to destroy the Mugabe neighborhood, which is a Palestinian neighborhood right next to the Wailing Wall and build a plaza for prayers instead and, and kick out all the families. So they were prone to irrational acts as well. What the Israeli government system is based upon is this concept of unofficialness, of decentralized power. Israel is very different than most uh, uh, Western countries because you don't have a government decision that is later acted out by government officials. M many of the decisions are being taken on the ground by low-level uh, clerks and officers. Also, very low-level military officers are making strategic decisions for the entire army. For example? Uh, for example, the open bridge policy of 1967 was a decision that was started by a sergeant who simply thought it would be more in the economic interest of Israel if Palestinians would be allowed to keep trading with Jordan so that they don't compete with the Israeli farmers. So that was a sergeant making a decision, and the army adopted that decision. Uh, also, the destruction of the Mugabe neighborhood was also a decision of the soldiers on the ground who m wrote in their diaries, we're not going to get permission from the government to destroy this neighborhood because then their, their protocols will say that they want to destroy the, the neighborhood, will take responsibility to make it easier for the government. So that's part of, uh, and, and that's something that still happens today. In the checkpoint, you can see soldiers of very low rank making life and death decisions. So, so, let's, so the issue of does, does occupying the West Bank from a purely economic point of view in the interest of Israel or not? Is, is, in terms of the interest of the 18 families and such, why occupy? In the, in the first 20 years, the occupation was profitable. Israel took more taxes from Palestinians than invested in their uh, infrastructures. That was a very clear and simple positive bottom line. And the cost of controlling the territories was very low because the, not a lot of soldiers were needed. But as soon as the Palestinians started, their resistance started the first intifada and, and started to organize widespread resistance. Of course, there was always resistance, but this was uh, on a much larger scale. Israel had to increase the number of soldiers 10 times. And Israel had to start building uh, more fences uh, around all the settlements and, and special roads for the, for the settlers and uh, uh, give them armor, uh, uh, armor vests and armored cars. And, and the meaning of that was that occupation stopped being profitable. So if you look at Israeli society as a whole, and if you look at the government budget, today Israel spends about 9% of the annual budget of the government just on maintaining the occupation. And most of that money, about two-thirds, is, is just the security costs. And the other third is, is subsidies for colonists to, to come and, and live in the settlements. So that system is, is a very heavy burden on the Israeli economy as a whole. But that doesn't mean that people don't profit from it. That doesn't mean that there aren't companies that make their wealth from selling security services to the Israeli government. Uh, perhaps a good example would be the Magal company. Magal is a former Israeli company that is now traded on Wall Street. And they're building uh, automated uh, uh, machines to build on the wall of separation, for example. And they're also building... Remote control guns and things Yeah, like exactly, that. exactly. And they're also building equipment for the wall between the United States and Mexico. And they were interviewed by an Israeli journalist and, and were asked, their, their CEO was asked, is building the wall with Mexico the same as building the wall in the West Bank? And he said, no, it's not the same because the wall in Mexico is only designed to stop people while the wall in the West Bank kills them. That is a company that, that analysts uh, in the stock market say is a good stock to buy whenever you hear there's a terrorist attack. Their stock will go up. In the next segment of our interview, let's talk about the political economy of the debate about a two-state solution. Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Sheer Heber.